So what can we learn from Dutch design and from the Netherlands? The first thing I think a lot of our students take, took away this year was this kind of sense of just getting down to it, just, just getting down to work, not making any excuses, not stopping, not waiting for the right time, just getting it done. I think Dutch people and Dutch designers don't even think about this. And it's because of the situation of the country that they live in and that it's been the way that it is for, for so long, for centuries. Um, in the political realm, the situation in the Netherlands is often referred to as the polder model. Uh, this is a way of kind of making uh, a country work that has extremely limited uh, economic resources around uh, um, uh, the resources that are in the ground, etc. So they had to be extremely creative about the ways that they can use technology uh, in order to expand the land. Uh, and the polder refers to any piece of land that's reclaimed by humans in order to make more land that's there by uh, a system of dikes. The polders are these uh, systems of, uh, of highs and lows within the landscape that uh, underneath, completely unseen by human eyes, are pumping systems that are working 24-7. So, what I find to be really incredible, incredible about that is that it's technology that's specifically for people, but it's also technology that's completely unseen. It's working every day. It keeps the waters at bay, which allows everything else to occur. Without it, the, the entire country would, would, would uh, go underwater. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, most of the, the land of the Netherlands is below sea level. Uh, so these unseen water pumps, above ground, you, you see it in the, in the, the, the windmills that dot the landscape. People think of windmills in the Netherlands as sort of these quaint reminders of the past. But if you go into the more countryside parts of uh, the Netherlands, you can see these long lines of, of windmills. And obviously, when you begin to see it, these long lines, you understand that they're, that they're a technological system that was put into place to pump, to pump things. Um, when you understand it in that way, you understand that technology is constantly working there, uh, and hopefully that gets you to think about technology in a different way. But philosophically, this idea of the Polder model is also a model for how to live, how to understand that you are always in this situation where you have to do all of that stuff in order to make it possible to work, and then you work anyway. And as a result of that, there's this shared responsibility to work, to not take things for granted, and this, this necessity to have to work in those ways, because otherwise there are those limited resources. Uh, they don't have the great uh, uh, um, other resources that the countries that surround them, like France and uh, Great Britain and Germany have. So they've had to be incredibly uh, creative and incredibly resourceful, and to this day, that's the way that they operate. The Dutch people operate that way, and Dutch designers operate that way. And so the, how that manifests itself in terms of the work that Dutch designers do is there's this constant uh, sense that of just getting down to doing things, just doing things, not doing things for the money, just doing things, and then as a result of doing it, all those other things uh, usually follow. So one of the other things that I would look at is as, an, as an example of how the Polder model works in the Netherlands is to look at the, the city of Amsterdam as an example of how a society is made by design. Design isn't something that's tacked on top. It's something in which you can see design all around you in the most uh, ingenious and yet subtle ways that unless you thought of it as being designed, you'd never think of it as having been designed. Amsterdam is a place that, as a result of the Polder model and the way that the Dutch think, has this kind of shared philosophy of working together. And, and, and this manifests its well, itself in, in, in ways, as an example, where the Dutch people are, are extremely welcoming. They're, they're, they welcome you without reservation. Uh, because they've had to be traders and they've had to connect outside because of their lack of resources, they, they all speak uh, English fluently. Uh, the fluency in English is 85% of the, of the the population. And it's not that they can speak English and they have a second language. They are equally bilingual in English as they as they are in Dutch. They'll always apologize for their for the for their for their uh, for their English, but uh, in experience it's unbelievably good. So how do we see this in, in the everyday experience in uh, in the Netherlands? Well, you'll see in some of the film work that we did and, and et cetera, the, the bike lanes. It's not just the bike lanes themselves. It's the way that this complex street system works and that the pedestrians and the bikes and the cars are, are all able to work together in a kind of a cooperative way. And, and the incidents of, of accidents or incidents of, of, of speed, et cetera, 
are almost never a factor. All of these systems work simultaneously. The car road network is right beside the street uh, network of the bikes. There's always a bike lane. It's always separate. It's always clear uh, um, to all the vehicles that those are the systems. You you don't you don't drive a car in the bike. You don't drive a bike in the car uh, lane. Uh, and in terms of walking, you have to get used as a pedestrian to kind of going in and out of those systems. Once you do that, uh, it, you begin to get you, you you begin to see this marvelous system that that works uh, at an incredibly efficient rate. And as a result of that, I think you begin to understand the Dutch society and the Dutch uh, people a lot better. Once you do that, you can begin to understand Dutch design. So the next thing to talk about would simply be this kind of entrepreneurial culture that exists there. They have this old history of being traders, of being small business people, uh, designers, um, the way that they work, how they work. They don't work in, in large firms by and large. They work in small offices. And as a result of this, that sort of like uh, individualism can be there. They don't like hierarchy in, generally, in, in general. They don't uh, therefore put themselves in position where all these hierarchies and other you know, departments within the organization can overtake a particular organization, say the marketing or the engineering or the management, uh, simply just doesn't get in the way. Uh, the Dutch people, as in general, dislike hier hierarchy. Uh, they dislike uh, needless administration and bureaucracy. And once you see that at work, uh, you can't help but admire it. They just go to what needs to happen, and they, they have a kind of a natural, organic way of making things happen. Uh, I would really recommend people look at the interview that we did at uh, in NDSM with Eva de Klerk. Uh, it's just such an astounding exa example of how the Dutch people just make things happen in an entrepreneurial way, even when you're you're uh, an artist and you're a group of squatters. Uh, and but also the way in which, as they developed that uh, that city uh, with within an old warehouse, a city of creatives. They, they created a flat uh, a system that, that uh, has almost no administration uh, and, and a, an almost complete lack of management, which is just incredibly uh, admirable. So the last thing I would mention in terms of what we learned uh, being in the Netherlands that struck, I think, all of our students was simply the, w the way in which the Dutch are so open to the world. Uh, when we spoke with uh, Andrea Bronzi, um, about four years ago. Bronzy talked uh, about Marshall McLuhan, uh, the Canadian theorist, and he quoted uh, us um, uh, uh, something which was really interesting that McLuhan had said about the way that Canadians work in the world, that they have this uh, ability to sort of look objectively to what's happening, let's say, in the United States, because they're always able to see it from the outside, whereas Americans look at what they're doing from the inside. And as a result of that, Americans, or sorry, Canadians in the world ha have, have sort of found this sort of niche for themselves where they're sort of in between things. They're in between the United States, they're in between Asia, they're in between uh, Great Britain and Europe. And as a result of that, they have a sort of a, a way of bartering and trading between the three, the, 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 the three, which allows them to sort of generate a place which is unique to the way that they do business in the world. And I think that this is something that Canada and the Netherlands have in, in common. The Netherlands is, is similar in this way. The Netherlands is in between uh, Germany, France, and Great Britain, and in each case, those are powerful countries that are inward looking. They have large populations, they're extremely su successful economically, and they tend to do work within their own countries without having to network out as much. The Dutch are, in, are not in that situation and they never have been. They've always been traders, always connected to the outside world, always connected to the eastern uh, part of the world always found a way of being the people who are in between, the traders that connect other people. And I think in this way, it was really quite revealing to, to see the way in which Canadians and the Dutch have something really in common and a sort of common way of thinking about the, wor uh, about the world that sort of goes beyond simply being Nordic uh, as culture. So what I think this means for our students is to understand that whatever the situation is, whether it's to think about Canada and its relationship to the countries that surround us in the world, whether it's the campus, the office, the city, the place that you work, uh, you always have to think about looking outward. 
Uh, my vision for See It is that we continue to build a school that looks outward, that isn't just about looking inward, that builds a, a, a culture for our students that connects them to the outside world, not just in philosophy or in words or in a, in a sort of a dogma, but in a kind of a, in, a, in real ways that gets at the maximum number of our students to out there to get real opportunities that connect our network deeper and stronger throughout the, the places that we can, we can generate real and, and deep and long-lasting networks as we've done in, in Malmö. Uh, Sweden with our exchange there in the relationships that we've set up in Italy. So my, uh, my goal would be as a faculty member here to connect uh, an ever greater number of our students to these kinds of uh, connective places and to see the relationships that we've built up in Malmö, uh, to build up more relationships in Copenhagen, to build up more relationships in Amsterdam and Rotterdam in a, on an ongoing, consistent, annual basis that we're connecting students with these networks, faculty with these networks, and building more and more opportunities for our students to be able to have these kinds of international opportunities and to build a stronger global network of collaborators.